So what happens is that you get to REM sleep, we know that you're in REM sleep, we zap your brain with magnetic current in the right frequency, in the right location, and it is enough to basically turn on your consciousness without waking you up. And you kind of wake up and you say, oh, but I'm still dreaming, game on. That's a new start. Today's interview is with Dr. Moran Surf, a leading neuroscientist who literally looks into living people's brains. He studies lucid dreaming and the brain and how we can hack it to become more successful. Today's interview is sponsored by Inspire Change Merchandise, which is linked down below. It helps support all our projects and future projects to help inspire the world. If you want to see more behind the scenes of these projects, please follow me on Instagram at Jordan Mulligan River. Let's jump into it. So just for people who don't know, just introduce yourself and what you do. I'm a professor of neuroscience and business. I spend my time studying the brain and helping companies implement knowledge of the brain to make better decisions in their day-to-day -day experiences. Okay, and early, early days, how did, uh, where were you born? What was childhood like? I was born in France. I was raised in Israel and I now spend a third of my life in the US. I guess what I'm known for, regardless of anything I would do as a neuroscientist, is the fact that I spent a decade of my life as a computer hacker back in the early days of the internet. So to an extent, I'm also the product of uh, the 80s where computers became personal. And with that, people heard access to the inside of computers and learned how to use understanding of computers to actually hack into systems, change and manipulate data, and actually understand how the world works from inside. Okay, so as, as a young man, was you interested in neuroscience early on, or was it more computer-based? I think as a young kid, I was probably not different than many others in that I was puzzled by the big mysteries of life. I just didn't know that science can answer them. So I was asking questions, I think, like every kid asks when they're about 10 years old next to a bonfire, um, how did the world begin? Are there aliens? What happens when we fall asleep and we wander outside of our mind? Uh, is God out there? Things like that. It's just that uh, later on in life, uh, about 15 years after, I learned that actually there are people in the world who try to answer those questions and actually make a uh, way towards giving them answers. So how, how, how did you get into computer hacking? What was that process like for you? I, I was a child of the 80s. At some point in the 80s, computers turned from like big mainframes that you cannot afford and they were sitting in a big room into something that people can actually have in their home. The first PC it was at the time available. It was still expensive, but it was available. And I got one. And when you got a PC back then, everything had to do with coding. You couldn't just copy a file from one place to another in like an icon. If you wanted to copy a file, you had to write a bunch of lines of code that just allow you to copy a file almost like byte by byte. If you wanted to play a game, you had to write codes for the game to happen and then run the game. And when you turn the computer off, the game is destroyed and you have to write it again a second time. There's no memory or hard drive. So all of those things made me really understand computers. I had to tinker with them a lot to grasp how they work. And as they got more complicated, I always was on top of things. So it wasn't surprising that at some point I became pretty good in doing things that were kind of at the edge of what computers can do. A friend of mine told me I'm trying to play Mario and I keep dying at level three. Can you help me? And I said, oh, that's not a problem. We just need to figure out in the code where is this screen and just change something and then you can move to the next level. He played, I don't know, Donkey Kong was a game that we played back then and I can easily eliminate the gorilla who throws barrels at you. And th those things were back then just kind of silly games uh, that I played with computers but they evolved quickly as the internet became a thing into actually doing the same thing on a much larger scale. Suddenly, instead of a gorilla in Donkey Kong, it would be Bank of America. And suddenly, instead of a Mario trying to get another level, it would be Amazon. And, and all of those companies started to have online presence, but they didn't really know how to protect themselves against hackers. So they would be hacked left and right in the beginning. And that is a time where they turned to people like me and they said, look, you know how hackers think and you uh, played with websites all across the world. Can you basically do what 
would want a, a company like that to be a reality which is simulate a hacker. So it's called white hat hacking. They would hire me. My job was to simulate a hacker as in try to break into the system as if I'm coming from the outside, find vulnerabilities and flaws in their security, teach them how to secure those and then help them basically protect themselves better. And at the time, pretty much every bank, every business to business organization that had a presence online would hire me. So you were essentially hacking these companies to, to help them out. How do you take the jump from that into neuroscience? Like most uh, narratives in life, it's a combination of, uh, you know, we tell, they tell the story backwards. I can tell you that all my life I plan and so on and so, but a lot of uh, luck and uh, randomness in this effect. I, I, the company I was working uh, for went public. So suddenly there was a moment to kind of decide if you want to go forward with a company or you want to change something. I did go to undergrad while working this company in physics, thinking that uh, that's kind of an answer to a lot of the mysteries of life and realize I'm not good enough to be a, a, a theoretical physicist at least. So I kind of said, okay, what now? Like, what other questions out there that can be answered by science? That, and, and it became clear that physics was the go-to place for most of my questions, the beginning of time, aliens and so on. But second to that was neuroscience, which had to do with consciousness and free will and whether our brain is there when we die and so on. So I said, okay, that's that's something else that I can attempt. And like the luck part in all stories had to be with me meeting a person who happened to be a neuroscientist, who was uh, an older uh, neuroscientist who retired already, but also had a Nobel prize uh, to his uh, arsenal, who happened to be himself a hacker during World War II. And he kind of found some kinship in my story and his story. And he said, if you're a hacker, your talents are really useful in uh, the realm of neuroscience. Why don't you change careers and go to neuroscience? And this conversation was enough to push even further uh, a negative that was already in my mind. All of those combined, mix them and kind of put some dressing, uh, makes a kid one day say, okay, I'm going to take a leap of faith and I'm going to leave at the time Israel towards California and try my chances in neuroscience. Amazing. So when you first got into neuroscience, what was one of the biggest kind of like shockers, the, the thing that really kept you interested? Because I mean, we can jump into something like that really, really big thing and think it's this all glamorous, you know, interesting, and then we, we dive into it and some of those things aren't what we thought. What was it that's carried on keeping you going? Science is not as glamorous as it may uh, seem uh, on a, a TV show or when you see the Nobel prizes awarded in October or even kind of on a CNN conversation where someone just describes how they found solution to Corona. It involves a lot of pipettes and uh, lengthy nights with nothing working and uh, failed experiments. That said, I think that I was uh, again, a bit lucky and a bit uh, kind of correctly planned uh, as to how to manage my risks. So when I joined a lab in neuroscience saying, here's what I want to do, my advisor, a PhD advisor told me, look, here's what you want to do. It's ambitious and it's risky and it's interesting, but you need to get a PhD. So we'll do two things. You'll do that risky, ambitious and interesting thing. And you're going to do another project that is very clear, mundane. It won't be a headline in a talk show, but it will be interesting and relevant for science. It's going to put a dent on the research. It's going to be one more thing that we need to know that's not glamorous. And you're going to do that first. And I will choose that for you. You don't get to choose what it is. Like you choose the one you want, and I choose the one you do on top of the other one. And you start with that. So I started by doing something that it seemed to me in the beginning kind of like you know painting the fence. Uh, if you're familiar with the karate kid the, uh, analogy, kind of uh, doing very uh, kind of routine science. Turns out that the within science was fascinating to me. And I think it's a lesson for a lot of people. You, you take a small task that you think, oh, that's just me kind of doing something so I can get to something else. And if you do it well, and if you do it, you will find it interesting because the brain wants to find meaning in things. You will find nuances in there. You will uh, start seeing where it could go. I fell in love with a small project uh, and, and it was kind of what got me going every time the big one failed again and again. In the end, they both kind of are part of my life. The big one also materialized and, and in a way uh, allowed me to kind of pursue what I wanted. But I think that both of them are what I love. I'll tell you what they are so it won't be so vague. Uh, the big project, which is 
probably what I'm known for as a neuroscientist to date is uh, the study of human beings with open brains and electrodes inside their head while they're awake. It's rare. It's not something people often do. Most neuroscientists study the brains of humans using machines like fMRI or EEG that image the brain from the outside. Rarely do we get a person that lets us open their brain, stick electrodes inside, and keep them connected to our computer for days while they talk to us, and we can look at the inside of their brain as it operates. Uh, those are unique individuals that have some brain disorder that requires a surgery, is the platform that allows us to actually open their brain and look inside. And once you do that, you can ask the big questions in science. You can ask questions like, where are your memories sitting? Really, can I touch your memory? Or can I change your decisions by just zapping one cell and making it operate differently? All the questions that I was interested in that I didn't know you can even ask and suddenly became reality. Wow. Uh, so just going on that, I just wanted you for a, normal, for a normal person like myself, how would you describe the brain? I can go with like a, a, a joke. And we can go with like a, a more mechanical one. So the, the joke would be, and I, and I kind of think that it's a joke, but I actually think it's true in many ways, uh, is that the brain is the most beautiful organ in the human body. But then when you say that, you ask yourself, which organ is making you say that? And that's also the brain. In that sense, uh, uh, I think it's uh, the part of us that uh, we think is us. So when I talk to you right now, I think it's like all of this body that's here is me. But the reality is that it's my brain talking to your brain. Like kind of the brain is, is the only part that speaks for me. And in a way, me is sitting only in like a couple of pounds here. Everything else are kind of peripherals of the brain. My hands, my arms, my legs. If I lose them, I'm still going to be myself. If I lose a part of my pinky in a car accident, it would be sad, but I would wake up the same person. But if I lose similar sized part from my brain, I might wake up a totally different person, not even recognizing myself, I have different memories. So the brain is the story of ourselves that uh, we carry along. That's the kind of philosophical and joking uh, aspect. The more mechanical one, brain is a set of uh, cells from a specific type, clustered together, connected to one another, that uh, is the only part of our body that keeps adapting in a big way after we're born. So to an extent, if you look at a baby's DNA, you can predict pretty accurately how tall they're gonna be, what their hair color is gonna be, uh, even how athletic they're gonna be, or uh, many things about their kind of existence 30 years after, because it's written and it's fixed. Who you are on that level is fixed. The only thing Mother Nature gave us as a way to deal with the world changing after we were born is the brain. It said, okay, we're gonna give you part of you that's fixed. You won't be able to control your skin color no matter what you do. But if the world would demand responses to changing temperature that would require you to maybe do things in the course of your eight years here, there's gonna be one organ that will keep changing and keep responding to things. And that's the thing that will uh, govern how you actually live your life once you're born. Okay, so with, with the brain, how much is free will? How much of what it's, it's deciding for us and we're doing, how much of that is free will? The, the simplest answer is we don't know. So I'll start with that to, to not keep anyone in suspense. Um, we do know something, but we don't know the real thing. In that sense, free will is uh, analogous to, uh, in physics, the question about the Big Bang. We can take you all the way to the very fraction of a second where it all began and explain to you everything from then on, how it evolves, how it expands, how, uh, but we don't know what happened the second before. Uh, and if there is something like that the second before. And in that sense, it's kind of anticlimactic. Like, yeah, all you want to know is how the universe started, not like the moment began onwards. So physicists leave us uh, wanting when they say, yeah, we can tell you everything from the Big Bang onward, but not a second before. And free will is similar. We can take you all the way to the moment and action cascades in the brain from this part to this part and how it led to you, say, choosing salad rather than steak over uh, lunch. But we can't tell you why this part sparked. So here's the, the, the bad news uh, is, is uh, kind of compounded with the good news. So the bad news is 
that indeed we can't really know if there's free will beyond the fact that at some point a cascade operation begin. The, the good news or the interesting one is that we're getting closer and closer to understanding the very origin of a thought. And what we know for sure is that it's way earlier than your experience of the choice. So if I ask you right now, Jordan, what do you want to have for lunch? A salmon, a steak, or a salad? And you sit there and you kind of say to me, salmon, the moment you said it is the moment you and I, as a listener, experience your choice. We say, okay, it's T1. He said, salmon, that's the moment he made the decision. But if you looked at your brain, we would find residues of your about to say salmon seconds before you said it. And you would not know about that. So you experience your choice when you say it. You have no awareness of the fact that seconds before your brain is preparing for the choice, it's evaluating things. Maybe it already had a choice 10 seconds before, before I even ask you the question because your biases are such that when I'm gonna ask you something, you're gonna go to the assignment and I can know it before I even ask the question. All of that is invisible to you and to me, but it's there. And if you have electrodes in your brain, we can actually predict what you're gonna answer in seconds later to questions you don't even know you're gonna be asked now. And that is puzzling and interesting because it shows that at least in our brain, there's a big gap between us, the thinking, speaking, conscious part that thinks that's me and a huge part of our brain that doesn't get to speak, doesn't get to experience the world in the same way, but it's actually the puppeteer of all our choices. We just don't know about it. So it's that predetermined kind of answer that's lurking in there somewhere. How much in our life is the, tr especially as young people, is, is the trauma and the experiences that we've had, how much does that shape how our brain is? Like, you know what I mean? Like how, how the way that my brain works now, how much of that is shaped by, by the traumas and things that have happened to me and the, the, the way that I am? It's a complicated answer to tell me if I'm doing a good job doing it. So in a way, most of us is in the past. Most of our experiences, most of our existence happened and stored in our memories and drives our decisions right now, but looks at a, a huge horizon of all the events we can remember and tries to tie them into a narrative. The present takes about a second and a half. It changes based on person to person. It changes based on conditions, situation, and how stressed you are and how fast things happen. But about a second and a half is all your brain uses as what it's called present. So right now, a second and a half passed. And everything that you felt about what I'm saying and your thoughts moved from one part of your brain, the experiencing part, into the remembering part, where it's stored, integrated with other information, and you don't really notice those kind of snapshots of present, 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 but it happens. And in that sense, every time you make a choice, on the moment of the choice, you actually take some part of the world, you load some part of your memory, integrate and make a decision, but the majority of the decision actually sits there in the background and is not driven by what's happening right here and now. You take information, you edit, but it's not the dominant part of a choice, which means that all the things happened to you before, your traumas, your past experiences, your positive experiences, the ones that drove you to kind of the reward that you got for things that made you try to amplify more of them. All of those things are uh, integrated and they dominate your choices. It's really hard to make an unbiased, clean choice in the present. There are ways to, to get better at that, but it's not easy. And that is kind of uh, the beauty of the brain and the challenge of the brain. Yeah, so <laughs> it's quite a scary thought in some ways um, and a positive one as well. But how do, how do we or, or can we unlock certain ways that we are now and unlock traumas or move past traumas that are making decisions for us? Can we do that work? Yes, so, so, so we moving to focusing on only one aspect of the past, which is bad experiences, traumas, which are important, but we should kind of make sure that everyone gets that they're not, it's not that trauma that directs everything you do. Trauma plays part in a big scheme of things. So traumas are usually a kind of system, a, a, a not failure, I wouldn't say, but like a, a, a difference in how the systems work. So in, in theory, the way memories are expected to work is you create an experience and it becomes a memory. 
And then this memory sits there. If you use it a lot, it becomes more strengthened and you have more access to it. If you use it little, it kind of starts fading away and you might forget it or you might kind of uh, not have access to all of the aspects of it. And one way to keep memories active is to actually use them. So let's say you had an experience and you tell your friends about it. By telling your friend, you kind of open the memory, loaded it for this time of conversation. And then when you're done, put it back in the, in the file. And then the second time you talk to your friend, another friend maybe, you again open the memory, use it, load it, talk it, and then put it. One thing we learned in the last couple of years is that there's actually a strange kind of curious thing about how memories work, which is every time we load them, we don't just put them back the same way into the same shelf. We load them and we open them to changes. As in whatever happens to me while I talk to you, we leak into the memory. And when I'm done using it, I'm going to overwrite the original with the modified version. So memories that get used often aren't just the same again and again, kind of being loaded, used, loaded, and put back. They're actually being loaded, manipulated a little bit, and gets overwritten. So it's kind of a telephone game. You use the memory enough, you will perfect it and make it better. There's a saying, the wolf is always bigger in my stories. That's actually true. We tell the story and one time we add one part and then we get input from the other person that this works and this is interesting. So next time we use this thing, by the time we tell the story a hundred times, we don't really remember how big the wolf actually was. The wolf is the one that we have in our mind after talking about the encounter with the wolf many times. All of that is how memories should work. This is what allows us to adapt and to keep changing and to keep fixing the narrative of our life so it works perfectly. Trauma is a failure of the system. Trauma is a situation where you load the memory, tell the story or experience it, and then you don't change it at all. And you can keep the same memory as it is. So the system that's supposed to help us get better and rewrite things so we can go forward with life without relieving the bad experiences doesn't work. You keep going back to the same memory and you don't change it. And that's what's happening when the memory is painful and our brain clings to it and doesn't let us get away with it. Like we keep seeing the same tank explosion in Afghanistan or the same breakup uh, uh, by the bridge. All of those things, they keep coming back and again and again. And our brain cannot let go and it cannot change. And that is when input from the outside is helpful. That's why people go to therapy or talk to their friends. They kind of force someone else's view into their memory with the hope of gradually changing it and making it better. Wow. Okay. So with that, that the changing of memories um we're kind of talking a little bit about a brain a brain hack and this is what something i wanted to it comes up so much with your name is hacking of the brain is this something that we can do and if it is what are the simple things that we're able to do so so disclaimer one is of course uh, there there kind of there's a difference between doing things to help yourself versus doing things to manipulate others so kind of Everyone needs to think about like what world they want to be in, a world where everyone hacks into everyone else's brain, changes their mind, and you can't feel fast on reality. I think it's a bad experience. So whatever you want needs to be a, a kind of asked a, in the context of, do we want the world to be that, or do I want to help myself? That said, there are moments where we're more or less uh, likely to have changes. And knowing those moments and actually using them to help our brain do its job is usually helpful. So first of all, let's start with kind of trivial one that are maybe not relevant to your audiences, but relevant to their kids, which is we know that the brain changes a lot more between the ages of zero to five than it does between five to 12 and 12 to 17. And then it starts slowing down and changing less and less. So if you have kids and they're between the age of zero to five and you wanna, so to speak, hack it to their brain by say, making them speak more languages, that's the critical time for that. Like if you, if you teach them languages between zero to five, they would acquire mother tongues. So they would have three mother tongues and they're gonna create enough space in their brain to speak each language as if it's their mother tongue. If you start teaching them languages at the age of 12, they would still acquire them pretty accurately, but it will become harder to make it into mother tongue. They will start translating from the new one into their mother tongue and then say it in the mother tongue and then translate it back. It will still be easy to learn, but it won't be the same. And if you start to learn language at our age, 20, 30, 40, you can learn but it will never become your mother tongue. So one aspect of hacking your brain is figuring out the right time in your life to train this brain to do things. <coughs> That's kind of too late for people in their late 60s, but it's important to think about the future. 
another thing uh, which aligns with the same kind of concept is that there are timing even in the life of older people where the brain is more malleable. For example, when you sleep. So sleep is one of those moments that uh, nature gave us for our consciousness to essentially be dormant and for processes in our brain to do their job. And that job would be to strengthen memories, to eliminate bad memories, to rehearse memories, to do this thing where you kind of load the memory, change it and modify it. All of those things happen when we sleep. So knowing that and knowing specifically which window of the sleep is the window by which process one happens versus process two could allow people to now use it for the advantage. If you really want to uh, rehearse uh, French history because you have an exam tomorrow and you know that memories get strengthened during a period of the night called slow wave sleep, you can actually trigger a, an activity that will make you use this process to rehearse French revolution history. And then you might remember it better when you wake up in the morning. That's one thing. If you know that, for instance, you're a, in a creative job and your job is to actually come up with new ideas, but you're lacking them, you don't know them. You should know that there's a window of time in the night where your brain changes its boundaries and it's much more likely to come up with new ideas. And not only do you need to get to this point, but you need to wake up at the end of this point so the memories are going to be available to you. So you won't forget it and push it. So, so all of those things allow us to essentially start using sleep and harness its powers to actually hack into our brain. I want to delete this memory and I want to strengthen this memory and I want to be more creative. And so, so allow me up here, do this to me and so on. That's, that's kind of another window of time that we can use. Then there are all kinds of aspects of, uh, I'll give you two more and then stuff because there's so many, mm -hmm. of uh, interaction with people and of technology. So I'll give interaction with people with technology. What we know more and more from my work and, and the work of my colleagues is that uh, brains don't live in uh, solitude. <clears throat> The people we interact with input our brain whether they try to like persuade us and actively try to give us content or whether they just act next to us and our brain absorb that. So for example, uh, if you want to be funny, one way to become funnier is to actually read the jokes and the kind of try to you know think of a lot of scenes in your life and see what's funny about them and make the work cognitively. Another entirely different approach is to put yourself next to comedians. Just presently sit yourself next to them and just talk to them. You will learn without cognitively being aware of that, a lot of things, how they cue a joke, uh, kind of how they set it up, when the punishment comes. You won't be able to even express it in words and say, aha, what they did is they took a pause and then put the punchline and this works. Your, your brain is like a sponge. It constantly takes cues. And if you surround yourself by a lot of people that carry traits that you want, they will, leak into you without you knowing how. You will just start being funny after a year being next to me without knowing actually how did I learn this thing or how did I become so good in, in telling a story? How did I become so good in solving problems of that nature? If you surround yourself with people that carry the things you want, it will leak into you. That's the approach that's uh, kind of social. And technology is uh, another one that I think will become more and more dominant in the coming years which is we now know how to change brains by thinking about them like you know, a car mechanic, like actually changing things. So if you have trauma that you keep, cannot get out of, like you keep reliving and saving it, reliving and saving it, and you don't know how to deal with that, we have all kinds of treatments uh, ranging from the kind of old fashioned ones of the last 20 years, which is we're gonna give you the right drug that will either block the resaving or will change somehow your emotional experiences and in that, doing that it will leak the memory and change your experience that's kind of the psychiatric approach or the therapeutic approach and we're now getting closer and closer to really neurosurgical ones we can go into your memory and zap something and do something while you think about that that will make your memory different and while right now this is mostly research i think it's coming to everyone wow okay that will be so surreal to have doctors fixing traumas in our brains. I mean, it'd be amazing. Um, just on, so I want to cover both those points because they're both super interesting. The being like a sponge and being around people and absorbing, does that work for everything? Athletes, businessmen, like being around successful people, would that help for every single person? It does work for every single person, but it's also a kind of a little bit unquantifiable. As in you don't like, whereas, a, so you, know, you don't know when, you know that 
from A to B, things happen, but it's really hard to kind of say, okay, I spent two weeks with the CEOs, I'm going to become ruthless. And like, a, a, it's, it's a lot of it is like a, in the, in the kind of moments that, uh, that your brain learns and, and it's hard to kind of predict those. So for example, let's take one example. You also have a character that you change the other people. So if you, if there's two people kind of, it's a, you want to be like this person, but you come and you might actually change them and they will become like you. So in order for change happen, you have to surround yourself by more than one person. So there's be kind of be some kind of a majority that you get different perspective and that you would be not dominant enough to actually change them people, but actually be changed by them. And it's somehow in the end, an average of that, like you do change others and they change you and you find a good common ground between that. And then there's the aspect of like, do you want to change? So some people, uh, have a character trait where they are certain about their uh, kind of personality so much so that it takes longer. Like it's true not just for kind of this uh, sponge analogy that we use, but also for therapy. If you go to therapists and uh, the first question they ask you is, why are you here? And you say, I don't know, I didn't want to be here. My girlfriend sent me. Uh, it's going to be a different uh, and much more challenging kind of process than if you say, look, there's this thing in my life that keeps happening, which I don't like, and I want to change, and I need help in doing that. Suddenly, kind of, you set the path to the journey. You might learn that this wasn't a problem and that it's impossible to, to solve all that they uh, actually like it and you don't want to change it. A lot of things could happen, but to an extent, a lot of therapies start by you having the willingness to go somewhere. And in that sense, you need to kind of hear it and say, I want to be funny in order to say, I'm gonna put the comedians in my room, I'm gonna spend time with them, and I'm gonna not try to change them, but I'm gonna try to kind of uh, be open to things that, that those, each of those things, which I just mentioned, like bringing it to the room, being open to that, wanting it and so on, could be a challenge in itself. But it works when it is taken. I love it. I mean, it's such a simple thing as well. And I, I love the positive side of it. What happens if we were to take a negative look of it? Do we need to eliminate people who are against that? So if it was um, people, <laughs> it's simple. If people were unfunny, do we need to move ourselves away from them? That's that's a great one. So so, so that's a good question, which which really get I always get asked about about kind of like how to do. But but what about getting? So I, I'd say I'd say it's complicated again, and it won't be a simple answer. But I'll try to do my best to kind of tell you how to know. So. In the end, we are simple. So if someone is toxic in your life and just, it's probably, doesn't take a neuroscientist to say, probably shouldn't be there. But the more nuanced version is that bad experiences are unpleasant, but they're also not something that we want to totally get out of our life and just say, I want like, to shelter myself. You learned maybe as much, maybe close to, maybe more, but a lot from bad experiences as much as you did from good ones. So this breakup that uh, you couldn't stop thinking about every time you woke up in the morning and thought, I'm never going to be able to uh, fall in love again and wrote poetry, maybe led to great poetry. Maybe it led to the next relationship being better because you knew what mistakes you made and you didn't want to do them again. Maybe it led to uh, you coming back to the same person six months later and saying, you know, you've said, hundred times when we were together that this is a problem, but I never heard it. But being away from you, it took me six months to understand, to hear it. And now I can come back and answer. So if you just kind of try to say bad, don't want it, you will not uh, get kind of different. Uh, the brain to be a little bit more technical has essentially a system for learning. It's very simple. It tries something and then it gets two types of feedbacks. And those feedbacks either strengthen connections in the brain, or weaken them. Those, those feedbacks are either reward system, it's set in a place called the nucleus accumbens, and it's the place that basically after you do something, gives it a score. How good was it? One to 10, I'm simplifying. 10, let's do more of it. One, let's do less of it right, in the future. And there's another system in mainly the insular cortex, the insula uh, pain. You do something, comes back feeling of pain, you try to, actively rewire, like do not just do less of that in the future, but not do the opposite of that in the future. Those two feedback loops happen all the time. Every time we take an action, we learn something. We order the salmon, we get an immediate reward for making a choice, we love that, but then we take a bite and it's disgusting and we get a pain and we say, okay, 
don't trust this part of your brain that made the choices because it failed us. So next time there's the options, listen to this one less, listen to this one more. And, uh, and then you learn that that one make a mistake too. So you say, oh, what am I going to do? So I'm going to take a guess next time and see you. you. Your brain does all of those things under the hood, but it tries things and it learns from things and it uses those reward and pain systems continuously to evaluate experiences and learn from them. And in that sense, the bad ones are half the system. Wow. Okay. Fantastic. So the, I want to jump back to the dreams as well. So when you talk about hacking dreams, is this a case of like set an alarm at a certain time? Like how, how do people practically implement it? So, so touching on one of my favorite topics right now. So you got to stop me when it becomes a uh, too long a monologue because, because <laughs> I can go. So dreams are fascinating to humans from the dawn of time. We find the uh, hieroglyphs in caves dating thousands of years ago of people thinking about their dreams, we all think they mean something and we all think that the meaning is uh, critical to our existence in the awake world. If you don't believe me, try waking up and telling your ex-girlfriend that you dreamt about, uh, sorry, try telling your current girlfriend that you dreamt about your ex-girlfriend and see how you would be punished in the real world, not in the dream world. It's like somehow we think that if you dreamt it, you must have wanted it and it's your you know, choice and somehow you're responsible for that. So whether it's true or not, dreams are, meaningful for our awake life, independently of the story that we experience when we are asleep. And, you know, psychologists have built theories and, and disciplines on interpreting dreams. You wake up in the morning, you tell your story, and they try to tell you what it means. Freud, uh, his most known you know, pedagogy is that of taking dreams and making meaning out of them. However, up to, I would say, the last 15 years, we didn't have access to dreams. We had access to the stories people tell about dreams when they wake up. So uh, Freud's patients would wake up and tell him a story. And he would make a lot of meaning of this story, but it wasn't clear to Freud or to the person telling the story whether that story actually was in their dreams or was it the same way they tell the story or was it in the same narrative. The dreams are, are confusing and, and kind of metaphysical and, and uh, they jump in, and we don't, we, we tell stories differently. We tell stories in linear way. We don't tell stories, I was there, then I was there, I, back in time, like we kind of try to always tell a story. So, so it was very hard for everyone up to the last couple of years to actually look at dreams. Come neuroscience, and neuroscience allows us now to look into your dreams directly. So we don't need you to wake up and tell us the story. We can look into your brain uh, while you're sleeping and decode in a very crude way not as impressive as it may seem right away, but in a way that already is improving day to day, look at your dreams. So now when we can do that, we can start answering basic questions like uh, are dreams similar to the stories we tell when we wake up? The answer is sometimes, not always. Uh, do uh, the dream time align with uh, real time? Turns out it is like five minutes in a dream or five minutes in the real world. Uh, can you solve problems in dream? Yes. Can you be more creative? We start answering questions that are kind of really interesting. And uh, also, we're starting to realize what's the function of dream. Why do we have to, to begin with? What, what do they give us? What can we do with them? And in that sense, one of the things we learned is that dreams are partly our brain's way of simulating things we desire and seeing how they actually feel. So you're thinking about uh, moving to Oklahoma and starting a business, but right now you and your family are living in New York. You don't know, should I give up everything and try? What am I going to do? You're not sure. One way to do it is to actually move to Oklahoma and try to see how it feels and learn that it might not have been a right choice. And then a year after you come back and learn something. Another way is to dream it. And the nice thing about a dream is that it simulates reality as well as it gets for the time of the dream, for the period of the dream, you think it's reality. You don't say, oh, it's future reality. I can take the goggles off and it's going to be over. You actually think it's going through, through as it is. And it, so it filters through your emotions and you actually get a visceral experience of that. So when you wake up, you might not remember anything about the dream, but the emotions about the experience are still there. And then when you talk to your wife and you say, you know what? I don't think we should do that. I feel that it, we want to enjoy it. It's going to hurt our relationship. You don't know why you have a feeling, you call it a decision that's based on something, but actually your dreams allowed you to simulate that in the ultimate VR experience and learn something from that. So that's a real one. Now, the last sentence on that, and then I'm gonna stop because I really can talk about it for hours, is that because uh, we now understand one of the aspects of dreams 
And because we can look at the, the movie you've seen rather than the story you tell yourself, we can also now start directing them. So not just reading your dream and saying, okay, this is what your dream was, let's talk about it. You can even go to sleep and say, I really want to dream of Oklahoma. Can you help me? Can you stimulate the right parts of my brain or give me the right kind of cues so that my dream will take to Oklahoma so that tomorrow morning I will have a clue because I really don't know. And that's a step kind of forward, which is we don't just think of dreams as something that happens to us, but we start taking the reins and we say, okay, we need a dream for something, but we're going to be the person in the driver's seat. Okay, so I, I've, I've, I've got to ask you about it then. Um, it's something I've, I've practiced for a long, a long time, and I've probably not done it for the last few years, but it's lucid dreaming. And um, I got into it for basket, basketball. One of, the, one of the NBA coaches spoke about lucid dreaming, how he used to get some of his players to practice in dreams. So I was like, I didn't know what it was, but I remember the first experience was just mind-blowing. Like I, and I've tr- I try and explain it to people, and they just look at me like a mad person. They don't believe me that this, this is a genuine reality in a dream. That's what it feels like. Um, what is lucid dreaming and is, is it a tool that we can use? So lucid dreams are a moments where while dreaming, your consciousness wakes up as in you are aware of the fact that you're dreaming, but you don't wake up. You're in a dream, but you're fully aware of that experience and you say, okay, I'm dreaming and I'm also the director, so I can do what I want. And I think the majority of people, what we know uh, from dream reporting uh, are doing is they immediately open the window and they start flying out. That's the common experience people uh, take on when they have the understanding that they can dream. They say, okay, if I dream, then I can fly above New York City and hover around Central Park and see it. And they immediately do it and it does happen. And what's nice about it is that you direct, like you say, I want to fly, but your brain creates the movie. Your brain kind of imagines how New York would look from above and gives you the movie that you want. It's like rendering the experience in real time. So you might fly above New York City. You might uh, summon to your dream uh, your perfect date, the person you wanted to be with all your life, but they're now married to someone else with three kids, but you still wish that you had a chance. Well, now they can knock on the door you open and suddenly he or she are there and you get to spend a lovely evening together uh, in the way your brain imagines the lovely evening to be and you, you're as kind of real as it can get uh, because it's a movie that you're the main actor. In. That's what lucid dreaming are. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to them. Uh, it turns out that you can both enjoy the entertaining part of that, but you can also use that to say eliminate the trauma. So let's say in your dreams, you keep going back to the explosion in the tank and you can't get away from it. You either wake up in a sweaty palms and like high uh, heart rate, or you just live for a nightmare. Now we can say, okay, we're gonna bring you to the situation, but for the first time you can fix it. In your dream, you can actually save your friend who's in a burning tank, or you can actually call help. Like you can do things and suddenly this allows you to really navigate the station differently, which helps your brain see things differently. Maybe you were injured, now you're not injured. You can actually now walk on two legs where you cannot do in the real world. It becomes, it, it's real. So, so, so in many ways, you, it's a short-lived experience, but it's, it feels real to you. Like you feel like you're actually walking. If you're, if you're in a wheelchair and you can never walk again, and suddenly you can run. That is a moment of joy that's worth the uh, everything. So there are, therapeutic uses to that. There are entertaining uses that you can bring people and enjoy flying. And it seems like there are also aspects of that that could be useful for the awake world in the kind of business aspect. You can actually, your brain when you're dreaming has less boundaries. You can say, okay, I wanna think about this problem that we've been struggling with in the company for the last 10 years and see it from a different angle. It's a little bit like a, being on a, a hallucinogenic drugs. You can choose a theme, but your brain will still go it, into it in different ways and you don't control fully how it's going to happen. And you will see something that's in your brain that you normally would just dismiss right away because you say, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Like, there's no way we can put a colony on, on the moon, so I'm not going to even go there. But in your dream, you do put a colony on the moon and you see that actually mining uh, moon
moon diamonds uh, is uh, lucrative for your business, but it's not too expensive to actually fly back and forth and bring the diamonds. And suddenly you're in diamond business uh, that's harvested on the moon, and you would not think about it in the uh, real world. That that's kind of a, a third use of lucid dreaming. So, fun, therapy, creativity, and the key thing up to recently was that it is something that only a fraction of the people in the world can experience naturally, about 12%. And we're getting better in giving it to many more people. Okay, so this is just one thing. This is a personal thing, because uh, if, if there is a company out there, I, will def I would invest. Um, do you think that, you talk about ultimate VR. If I, when I think about my, my lucid dreams, if somebody could have a machine or a, a pill or something that could initiate a lucid dream instantly. Do you think that's on the way? Do you think that could, is ever a possibility like PlayStation v Lucid or what? I, it just, yeah, it just sounds like a very interesting thing to me. I, I was, I myself uh, am being asked routinely and helping a number of companies. Uh, so, so, you know, now I'm, I'm kind of sitting in the uh, conflict of interest seat because I know a few companies that are aiming to do that, that I help. I think that, I think it's, it's likely to be a reality. There are challenges when it comes from like a lab experiment to real world. So, you know, you, you in the lab, we're satisfied when it works 70% of the time. So 70% of the people who come, we can give them this dream and they're living exciting, but 30 percent don't. It's very hard in the business world to sell a product that you say, hey, this PC might not turn on 30% of the time, so your data is going to be lost. The, the real world requires 100% uh, or, or close to that. Uh, and so, you know, so companies, I think that, that go into realms of unknown that struggle with the real world, which is you wouldn't pay a thousand dollars for something that wouldn't work. So until we get a hundred percent, we have to package it differently and say, okay, even if it doesn't give you a lucid dream, we can give you those 10 things that would be valuable and maybe it will and over time. So, so I, think that, I think that now you, you're kind of going with me into the challenge of turning lab experiments into real world studies or, or products. And it's a challenge that, uh, is why a lot of things don't make it, uh, even though they're cool. Like you go to the lab and you see, oh my God, you have self-driving cars that can also fly. Why do I not sit in the street and tell you, well, because self-driving cars sometimes crash and, like, uh, and uh, the world doesn't let you drive a car that's safe and faster and like, uh, kind of takes you on a ride chair from your home to wherever you want without parking and all of those great things we can do, they require perfection in order to be in the real world. What's, what does it look like that's at the moment? Is it like, is it like a, something that will wake you up and keep you asleep so, like light leds or is it like some chip in the brain or the, the the easiest simplest thing we have right now and that's all public data because we did studies and the studies are published academically so everyone can just take it and build their own if they wanted uh, is, is the, the kind of the most uh, intuitive one requires still uh, two devices and a person that sits next to your bed so i'll tell you what it is but you see why it's not trivial but it's also, you see how to overcome that. What we do right now in the lab is if you join our subject, we have you come to the lab and we put something on your head that's called EEG. It's a device that's kind of like a, you see in the movies, like it's kind of like does, you know, beep, 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 but only for the brain. So it looks at the brain waves, a little bit more uh, uh, nuanced. It has many, many like electrodes scattered over your brain and they all measure your brain activity. And all this uh, thing does is it tells us when you're asleep. And when you're in a stage of sleep that's called REM, rapid eye movement, which is the most likely uh, stage where dreams could occur. They could occur in other places, but REM is the kind of seat of dreams uh, in many ways. Like probability of having a dream is much higher. So this device, all it does is just reads your brain activity and sends it somewhere. Uh, but that somewhere, there's a human being who needs to look at your brainwave and know how to read those things and say, aha, right now is in REM. That person, uh, right now, it's a, it's a te te sleep techni technician. They're trained for that. They do it really, really fast and really, really accurately. There are ways to, over, to uh, do it with machines. So you can, and that's where the 70% versus 100%. If you train a computer to do that, the computer would be, for the most part, accurate in detecting that you're in the REM stage even, but sometimes they're gonna make mistakes. And if you make a mistake, everything falls apart. Let's say either a machine or a human detected that you're right now in the REM stage, they now have to press a button that activates a, a second machine, that machine is called a, the a transcranial magnetic stimulator. It's a little a magnetic coil that you put close to the head, not in any way painful, not in any way troubling, but it kind of injects magnetic current. We have to put it next to specific locations, the temporal regions and the frontal areas, F3, F4, so specific locations. 
a specific uh, current, specific kind of stimulation, the, the frequency matters here. It's 40 Hertz to activate gamma cells. It becomes technical, but not too much. Like we can, you know, we can calibrate all of that in, in five minutes of, of like, you know, button presses. So what happens is that you get to REM sleep. We know that you're in REM sleep. We zap your brain with magnetic current in the right frequency in the right location. And it is enough to basically turn on your consciousness without waking you up. And you kind of wake up and you say, oh, but I'm still dreaming. Game on. That's when you start. Amazing. Amazing. I, I could literally talk to you for hours on lucid dreaming, but I, I won't. I'll, um, I will move on. But um, that is so... I, so with that, you, do you feel that that can be packaged up? Just a yes or no? Like, do you think they can package that up eventually? And yes, I, I, close. So I, I think that I think that uh, it, it's going to happen. Uh, either people are going to say we're taking it uh, even with like seventy percent accuracy because we seventy percent is high enough, or they're going to buy it for something else because it's going to be part of your PlayStation Nine, and it's going to be like dream lucid dream kind of function there's gonna be game for that and and for some people it's gonna work less than, than others and they're gonna be okay with that. that's my intuition yeah i i genuinely believe that that um it it would be worth it even if it was 10 percent, people would buy it but okay so uh business and entrepreneurs we have a lot of people who follow the channel yes. who are like businessmen or entrepreneurs or people really trying to get into stuff in your if you was to deal with somebody who was an entrepreneur or a businessman what's the sort of brain hacks or things that you would work on simple things that people can use straight away that's a great one i'll give you a very specific answer diary of all the things uh, i i would call it brain diary so if if there's a business woman who's seeing me right now and she wants one kind of concrete tip that could help her uh, kind of be on top of her, her thing here's the thing that i would say every person has a profile of thinking that is theirs there isn't a correct one or incorrect one but there is one that is yours maybe you jordan are making decisions better in the morning and your wife makes better decisions in the evening maybe your best friend makes decisions better when they're hungry and your boss when he's full one of you makes it better when you're surrounded by a ton of people giving you advice and there's a lot of noise another person with their own it's not that there's a correct answer the decision should be made in the morning alone when you're full there's no correct answer but there is one for you for every person there is a profile a, a set of kind of attributes that makes their choices best for them best means their outcomes are positive and they're happy with the choices they made they don't go back after and say oh i should have done this. you you like them Maybe they're wrong, but you still say, this is what I would do if I were given the same opportunity tomorrow to do the same thing. Those are the ones we want to you know, amplify and nurture. So the thing is, everyone needs to learn their profile, know what it is. Neuroscientists would offer you one approach, which is to bring it to the lab, put something on your head or put you in a scanner and have you play all kinds of games and tests, and they will tell you. You seem to do better when the tasks are cognitive than emotional. You seem to do better when the tasks are real time versus given more time. They're going to tell you. And one approach is to have me or your local neuroscientist study your brain and give you the answer. Another approach is diary. You can get, I think, 80% of what you can get from a neuroscientist by just observing yourself. So here's what you do you take a piece of paper or a little uh, 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 kind of notebook and you live your life for the next week while monitoring it. What it means is when you're confronted with a choice, big one or small one, you pause for a second, you take note of the condition and then you make the choice. For example, you're in a restaurant and they offer you the steak, salmon or salad. You take a note, these are the options I was given and here's what's happening. I'm stressed right now, it's morning, I'm hungry, I'm uh, alone. You kind of take, and then you make a choice. You choose the salad, and then you write in your diary. These are the options I had. These are the conditions I was in. This is what I chose. And then you move on. And another choice comes, and maybe this one is, would I uh, you know, sell my company or not? A much bigger one than the steak salmon, but you still approach it the same way. You say, here's the option. Here's the advice I got from my finance person, from my best friend, and so on. Here's the choice I made. You just write the conditions, the options, decisions, and then you wait. At the end of the week, you go back to your diary and you look one by one at choices and you, from the perspective of time, evaluate them and you give them a thumbs up, thumbs down. You say, Simon, still would make the same choice. I'm happy with it. Manager of the company, probably not. 
and you kind of give them a score, I don't know, one to 10 or just plus or minus or something that makes you look back at the choices. And then you do the last part. You can do it alone, you can do it with someone who you trust uh, to be fair and objective. You look at what's common to all the choices that you are happy with and what's common to all the choices you're not happy with. Maybe you're always with someone. We make not, not the same person even, but with someone. Maybe you're always uh, hours before the deadline. Maybe it's always in the morning. You start learning what is your profile. When you do that, you will say, okay, I guess I didn't know, but I guess I'm a morning person. I think I'm tired in the morning, but I'm happy with the choice I made in the morning and I didn't notice that. So from now on, I'll try to put myself more in the morning when I'm about to make choices that are critical. Maybe I realize that this person that I thought is uh, actually not helpful for me is really helpful because when he says something, I do the opposite, but I want to hear his opinion so I can do the opposite. So I'm going to bring him to the room every time I can choice so I can see what he says and then go make the opposite. So it doesn't matter. Like It's not that, that it tells you what choices to make, are, but it tells you what conditions you want to put your brain in. So you're going to make choices that would align more with your outcomes that you like. I love it. I love the... the um analogy there as well with the um having someone who could be negative in the room but it's all, yeah. all of your positive decisions are lining up when that person's around and it's it, it's it's really hard in a, in a moment to think i would probably think get him out of the room because he's, he's really negative all the time but yeah looking backwards you'd be able to see that actually your brain's working a completely different way and making the right decision because that person's there which is fantastic that's such a yeah so is there a brain diary that exists or is it scrap of paper or? Anything that you like, so I would say, make it easy for yourself. Like if, you, if it's too complex, if you always type it and or if you, then you wouldn't do it. So I think, I think, think like we, we want to minimize friction from like how to not uh, say, okay, this just I'm going to do in the evening. I'm going to remember. That's not, that's not going to work. We need it to be easy. Like, you know, if it's a, it's, if it's a friend that you dial and you tell him just try down or, or anything that will make you actually follow through, Helpful. That's why I'm saying one week. Uh, the alternative is, of course, to go to a lab. So if you if you really say I can't afford to to do this thing, I need and I'm willing to you know pay more money or or kind of uh, spend more time with someone, else, then you can go to a lab and 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 a neuroscientist will do a similar thing for you. They're gonna have you make decisions in a lab and they're gonna have you take 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 tasks and participate in them and they look at your brain and they will tell you, look, you seem to do better A B C. It's just that I think that if you ask for something that anyone can do tomorrow, that is one thing. Love it. So is, is there any benefit in journaling in, in general, like just a general day-to-day -day journaling? So generally, so, so I would say, and, and this is kind of my personal experience, and, and I think backed by a lot of kind of work in, in clinical psychology, writing down thoughts is helpful. Uh, the process of writing forces you to uh, think it in different words it slows down, it takes longer to write. So you actually have to pause and not just like, if, if someone tells you, if, you, if you were right now sitting in front of the bus station, waiting for the bus board, say, oh, I'm gonna think of my life. Suddenly your entire life will flash in like, I say, okay, I thought I did it, I done. But if you had to tell someone about your life, 20 minutes will pass easily. Because it's the same thought that you have all your life, but saying it in words requires a narrative. It requires A, B, C and arc. It requires a, a seeing it from the perspective of someone else and like finding ways to translate it. All of those things happen when you require uh, writing or telling uh, of a story. And that is why a lot of therapy requires not just you sitting by yourself and thinking about something, but having someone else that maybe says very little, but you talk at them and you have to build it in a way that will be meaningful for others. So writing, journaling, talking to others, all of those things, they help the brain see the same story in a different light. Something that I've used a lot, uh, and I hear, I hear about it a lot from successful people, but I'd love to hear your opinion on it, is like a visualization or manifestation and having like positive thoughts and or genuinely believing that I've achieved something before I've achieved it. It works really well for me. I've seen it work really well for friends of mine and athletes who I know. Is it a real thing? Does it, and does it help in the brain or? So I'll, I'll give you the, the, the yes and the no. So, so to an extent, there's kind of like this, um, you know, mystical approach that says, if you imagine that you're rich, you're going to be rich. No evidence for that. It, it's like, it's, you know, it's useful to think positively and it's useful to have goals. And it's useful that if you vision the goal, you actually can 
more likely to envision the, the sub goals and do them. So, so to that extent, like it's helpful. But just sitting in, in your on your couch and imagining uh, being rich and thinking about it won't make you rich. You have to actually go out and do something for that to happen. So, so, so the so the negative is that like just kind of uh, believing it, we, we have no evidence that it works. We do have evidence that actually thinking about a, a, a task concretely and saying this is like just saying out loud, I want this is what I want, and and breaking down to steps and saying and these are the things I'm gonna make to make it happen. Those things actually help. That they break down an untangible kind of goal, which is I want to have a kid to, OK, for that, I need to work on this, this, and I need to talk to my person about that. And you kind of like start. So that sounds like it is. And I would say there is some evidence that in some domains, actually just thinking, just imagining does make a difference. I'll give you an example that's concrete. There's a study, I forget by uh, whom I uh, uh, to come back to me, maybe, that shows that uh, if you're trying to diet, to not eat, and actually before you go to the supermarket to buy food, you sit, you close your eyes, and you really imagine eating and opening the box and kind of taking a bite and chewing and so on. Doing this thing actually activates some part of your brain to an extent that it actually makes your body respond as if you've eaten something and, and it lowers the hunger. So when you go to the supermarket, instead of just taking the entire kind of uh, junk food shelf and putting in a box, you will be a little bit uh, fuller, uh, a little bit less likely to be tempted. So, so in that sense, there are some kind of concrete things that we can do that actually affect you know, metabolism and, and physiology so that you actually are a little bit hungrier, a little bit, sorry, not, not a little less hungrier, a little bit fuller. So, so, you know, I think you asked me more kind of mystical thing, like me imagining being rich, will it actually change the world? There's no quantum effect by which you imagine something and reality kind of finds itself, but our brain drives our thoughts, drives our actions. In that sense, the more we put in the brain concrete thoughts, they will lead to actions. So it, it's relevant. No, no, it's, that's, I mean, the, the hunger thing, that's uh, amazing. Is, is there a thing where, uh, I, I can't remember who I was speaking to, but it was something about, creating a false memory almost in your brain so that you make the right decisions to get to the that becoming a real memory is that not a, is that a possibility so so it, it's another pandora box that you just opened which you should go, but yes so so uh, so it's true because if, if you take back what we said earlier that most of life happened in the past and it's stored in memories and we are in the present only for about a second and a half then everything we think about ourselves is just a set of neural firings in the brain that carry information from the past. And if someone can think of those, they change not just a memory kind of, okay, now instead of having chosen the salmon, I made you think you chose the steak, maybe you're a vegetarian. And by me changing the salmon to the steak, or let's make it easier, salad to steak, I just shook your entire identity. And if I create a memory of you yesterday having a steak, because it leaks into your current existence, you change your entire story of me being a vegetarian, which plays into you being a liberal, which plays into you being maybe a, a Democrat voter, which like suddenly kind of a, a small change could kind of perpetuate an entire different narrative from your perspective. In that sense, what, what is known as false memories are not just, okay, I remember it was two and it was actually 3 p.m. It could be, I remember I was in this place and I wasn't in that place. And I remember that I said those things and I didn't say those things. And it could be an entire thing. And we know that the brain is capable of that because of this idea that we load memories, use them and overwrite them. There's a kind of a small window of time where the memory needs to be resaved. And if someone intercepts the memory while it's being resaved and changes it or, or changes something by directly getting to your memory and, and intercepting them in your head, you can wake up a different person. So you open up a Pandora box of conversation because that's something I spend a lot of time thinking about lately because we're getting closer and closer to doing that. But it's something that is worrying. Can you take a memory, bring it up here, adjust it positively, and then put it back? Therapy does that all the time. Therapy is all about, you take a bad memory, you go to a person whose expertise is in helping you shape memories and look at them differently, and their job, if you do it right, is basically to say, Jordan, tell me again about the breakup. So they make you pull the memory, load it. And then you tell them the story that you may have told them already three times in the last three sessions. But if they're a good therapist, they will recognize what are the moments that make this memory negative. And then they're gonna intervene. They're gonna say, you know, John, I, I wanna tell you something. 
you just said that uh, you didn't do anything and she just left you. Well, I want to remind you that the day before you said something that actually might be seeming like you said something that, that prompted her. Or maybe you always tell yourself the story that it happened to you, but actually I remember that 10 times in your life that, that you uh, said to me that this was something you... So they're going to inject a new perspective. And you might say, oh, or not, and so on. But in that, they change the memory. So when the session is over and you're going to overwrite it, you now have a new lens on that memory. And if they're good, they know when to put it, how to frame it, and so on. So the week after when you come, you already will load a modified version and open it again for a small dent again. And uh, after six meetings, you will see the story differently. You will still remember that there was the event but maybe you will see totally a different lens. And that is the point of good therapy, of good interaction, of journaling, of uh, any input into the brain. I think we've, we've already spoke probably about five, five or six different ways of, of hacking the brain. Is, is, is there loads more? Like, is there loads more? Have we covered most of them or? Not only are there loads more, it's also like be between the time we started talking and, uh, and the time we finished talking, there must be a new one. We're learning a lot about the brain all the time. And think about it like from the perspective of neuroscientists, you and I focused on humans because we are humans and the audience are humans and so on. But the bedding for all the research comes from actually animals where we learn so much. So we know how to do insane things with animals that we're never gonna, or not, I shouldn't say never, but we're far from using humans. Like we know how to take memory from animal one and put it in memory in animal two. So it's just like copy memory. We know how to, a strengthen memory or delete memory in the brain of an animal. So we know about thousands of hacks that work on brains, but were not implemented yet in humans, which kind of are, you know, kind of uh, worms or a uh, huge opportunity, treasure trove uh, of things we can do. And I think that in the next couple of years, we're gradually going to translate them to humans and you'll see more and more tools available in your arsenal. If, for myself and for many people who, who follow this channel, we, we have goals of five to 10 years from now. Um, the, the ultimate goal or the, the big goal that's in the forefront of our mind, um, as most successful people do, what do you see from the people who have achieved those goals is like a common thread and a common link from the neuroscience side? It's a great question. So, so I would say the kind of, if people have been given diaries and questionnaires for a while where they were asked kind of what do you want in life? I would boil down the answer to one word, happiness. That's the thing that most people say they want. They just have different theories on what would give them that. If you ask people, okay, what would make you happy? A lot of people, think that money made them happy. They kind of list in the top five thing, money. Uh, other people say relationship. Like if I just married the woman I love, or if I just found the guy that I uh, dream of, or if two of us would have kids, that's another kind of big theme uh, uh, among people who have kids. Uh, usually it's when the kids leave home, uh, when we get time for ourselves again, uh, finally, when we retire, so there's, you know, kind of like, depends on where you ask a person, you get opposite answers. Like, I want kids or I want them out of it. But uh, either way, people have theories on what will make them happy. And unfortunately, most of the theories are not true. Uh, there's a name for that uh, in psychology. It's called the treadmill effect. You walk towards a goal, you get there, and you actually realize that you're in the same place that you were before because it's not it. Uh, for the most part, People who wanted money and got the money did not change their happiness. People who wanted uh, money and lost a lot of money did not decrease their happiness. People who got married did not, you know, there's a spike. If you wanted to uh, have a kid and you have a kid for a few weeks, months, days, you will have a spike in happiness very quickly. It decays, if not to uh, where it, below it was before, at least to where it was before. So I think that the goal of happiness is probably shared among all your audience members and viewers. How to get there is a different thing. And science can tell you, first of all, what doesn't get you there. The things I said before, money, uh, kids, relationships aren't. What does? And those are sometimes mundane things people don't uh, believe in. Or even if they believe, say, yeah, yeah, come on. But not me. Like, I will need the money or fine, but I'm not willing to do it. And, and for an example, uh, sleep, high quality sleep. If you go to sleep every day in 
good time and spend many hours and not use a lot and so on, you're going to be happier in the days after a lot more than if you made a million dollars. Sounds to most people, ah, not me, but the, the, the diaries we ask people to report, there's that. Uh, exercise, you know, if you, if you, like healthy living actually contributes to happiness a lot more than a lot of things that are external. Uh, and in that sense, I think that if there's one take home message for your audience is that they're probably aligned on the one word answer, which is they want happiness, or some people see it as the reverse, say minimize suffering, that either way, that's what people want. That's probably true for a lot of people. How to get there uh, requires a little bit of work on knowing what's the right goal and how to get it. What I love is that the brain is so complicated, like what we're talking about is so complicated, but the the way of not fixing it, but the way of getting the most out of it is very simple. Some of the stuff is really simple stuff, like exercise yeah. and sleep and diaries. I think simple as in weak, tangible, but I think for many people, those, those things are, are uh, they seem kind of, they say, they say, okay, right now I have a nine to five job. When will I actually go to the gym? Or how can I? So in many ways, I think there's, there's some people that find it kind of just, they say, I can't because of life. And even a lot of people who can, it's kind of, you know, I, I was surprised and that's gonna, uh, uh, I was surprised by how many wealthy billionaire that you see in the news and so on, look unhealthy and unfit. So I say, okay, like the, the, the people who work nine to five, they say, well, if I had time, I would definitely go to you. And then you see people that, you know, seemingly they have, and they also don't because it doesn't, like, it's not just about the opportunity. You have to actually have your, the same brain that benefits has to also want to take the effort. And a lot of us know different scientists, uh, billionaires uh, are living in a world where it's very hard to do the right thing. We live in a world that's complex. There are so many options, so many things, and a lot of frictions and a lot of barriers to getting simple things, some by design and some just because the world is rich of things. In theory, no one should be hungry in the world right now. There's abundance of food, but there are people are hungry. And that's because of politics. And that's because of like the kind of way we created the world. And even among the people who live in say the US where I live right now, because we have so many options, people don't know, they go to the restaurant, they don't want to choose. And it does, so even though all the options are there and it seems to be just go and choose, like the world is your oyster. We created a world that every restaurant has everything that actually doesn't work with our brain that likes simple things, easy things. And that's why we might not choose the right food in the restaurant and we might not go to the right restaurant and so on. And rich or poor, smart, stupid, uh, healthy, unhealthy, we somehow all live in a world that doesn't make it easy for our brain to do the right thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it is one of those things where um, it's, we see people at the heights of success and we just assume that they've got everything sorted out and everything's fixed for them and they, they must have the answer to life and to the brain. And yeah, it, it's so easy to assume that. Um, the, the last one I wanted to ask you about is just the, the journey of what we perceive as success. For me, I've always said it's not the, the idea of having the Oscar or the, or the dream studio or whatever it is, or the money, um, it's, it's the process in between for me that's always gave me happiness and made me feel not successful, but content. Does, does that go back to the point of um, what was you were just talking about? Is it's not, it's, it's fine and happy. It's not that result. It's not that million dollars in the bank account. So I'll say two things. I'll, I'll give you the negative, also give you a positive. Like something that's something that, uh, that so yes, the, the negative is that for the most part, people have wrong theories or wrong models of what will make them happy. And they spend a lot of time and energy going there. And if they succeed in getting it, they realize it wasn't what they wanted. And if they fail, they constantly live their life thinking, oh, like it didn't happen to me. Either way, a misery. Like no matter what, you're not getting happy, which is the goal that you actually had. So on that sense, I think pretty gloomy uh, uh, kind of answer. I'll give you the positive version. First of all, many people, uh, if you ask them about kind of happiness, uh, they have a kind of a, you know, a, a theory, when I'm gonna be happy, I'm gonna be just happy all the time, smiling. 
like kind of a cartoon character in a in a kids movie. The reality is that it's not how happiness looks. It's made of moments, and in that sense, many people, if they kind of pause and look at their life, they realize that they're already close to being there. It's just that they're not aware of it. Like I think there's there's studies on like people being asked, "How happy are you?" Moment to moment, turns out that most of us are kind of able to find joy and in, in in small moments, like when when some something nice happened. And in that sense, if you kind of lower this uh, expectation for like peak happiness continuously forever, you will realize that you're already close to there and with a few tweaks, you can get more of it. So that's kind of one positive in, in just remove the label of I want to be happy, which is me being on a high constantly forever. That's never happening to anyone. When you get there, you just get used to it and that becomes your no norm and suddenly something else never. So, okay, that's one. The other thing is of all the things that I could kind of recommend that uh, that give you the experience of happiness moment to moment like you don't need to get to a goal it's relationship with people so uh, a lot of people report that just having interaction with people ideally positive ones but even not always positive just the, the mere interaction is really really helpful to feeling happy time passes differently you your brain processes information differently you have to tell your story and load memories and change them all of those things are enough to actually affect our brain positively. So if you're looking for a way to kind of right now get this long lasting feeling of happiness that people imagine, I would say focus on having positive relationships in your life that you cultivate and interact with often. And you will, when you look back at the last week and you say, okay, what happened? You say, oh, I was happy 90% of the time. And because I spent 90% of the time with people and that, that, that would be closest to what people have in mind as a theory of happiness. I love it. I think, I think I'll, um, we'll, we'll finish on that one as well. Um, where is the best place that people can find you and your work? And I mean, what would you recommend them looking into first as well with your work? I'm the easiest person to find. Uh, if if uh, someone uh, looks me up, unfortunately, they will find more than they want. And, and just look my name, there's going to be infinite. Okay, I love it. Is, is there anything, any, so, are you on social media at the moment or is it, uh, you've got your website, I'll, which will all be linked down below? That, that's the easiest way. I mean, I, mean, I, I you know, I, I don't tweet, I don't, uh, but, but the world kind of somehow uh, finds a way. So I think that the, here, this is the way. Like, uh, uh, yeah, I agree. You, you'll tweet. <laughs> I love it. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. It's a pleasure, Don. I hope it's going to get to a lot of people because I think you asked great questions and I think that you translated it to real people's needs. So I really hope that people won't be intimidated by saying, oh, neuroscientist is not going to be relevant for me. I like, don't know what to do. That actually there's a lot of things that everyone can use right now to make their life better. And I really hope that someone listens to it right now and says, oh, that's something I can do and will be helpful to me. Wow. That interview for me was amazing. The idea that we can change our brain, our thoughts and our dreams to help us achieve success and happiness blows my mind. <laughs> All Moran's, Dr. Moran's stuff is going to be linked down below, so please go show him support, some support. And please go show support for our Inspire Change links down below as well. If it's something that you can get behind, uh, it helps support the projects, it helps support the channel. And for me, it's a message that I stand by. I really want to help inspire change. I hope this piece of content has helped inspire change for you today. And if you want to see more behind the scenes of these projects, please go follow me on Instagram at Jordan Rodenborough. As always, have a blessed and productive day and go inspire some change. Peace.